Some say a good gauge RNR result is anything lower than 30, while others demand that it should be lower than 10. Are they really that much more critical? Well, they're probably speaking a different language. Hello, I'm Tom. Welcome to my channel, where we talk about continuous improvement in an industrial setting. And this video, it is about gauge RNR and specifically about an important part of interpreting the results. You see, we talk about gauge RNR quite a bit. And my favorite video, my most popular video online, is on gauge RNR. But what we don't discuss clearly enough is that there is a big difference between that average and range and that ANOVA method. See, the traditional way of gauge RNR, and actually the one I still like the most, the average and range method, it also comes with a sort of a, a guide that if the result you get is better than, lower than 10, wow, world-class measurement system. If it is lower than 30, it's still probably good enough for most applications. Then the ANOVA method also came out and been out for years now, but it also came out and it's getting more and more popular, especially since we've got statistics packages that can do it for us. Because honestly, the ANOVA method, even if you use Excel's statistical package to calculate the ANOVA, that's not all. You still need to do a couple of steps to get RNR from that. So it's not the easiest way to use. But when that one came out, it also came with a recommendation, and that is the RNR has to be lower than 10. So I guess, and that was also my first reaction back at the time, that this is, and I think many people might be stuck with that, is that this is just, you know, sort of the technology moving forward. We've got this nice new method and all, but it was sort of a coincidence that people who are maybe a bit pedantic about per se using this better statistical tool, that they also say you need to have better measurement devices. So forget that bygone era where you could have 30% of your variation coming from your measurement device needs to be lower than 10. But that is an absolutely incorrect conclusion. In fact, 10% on the ANOVA method is generally worse, well, maybe not worse, but it's about the same as 30% on the average and range method. 10% on the average and range method is way better than 10% on the ANOVA method. Hmm. So these here indications, right? This higher than, did I do it? I did it the wrong way around. Higher than 30 is wrong. Let, let, me, let me immediately correct this for you. I prepped it the wrong way around. See, I also make mistakes, um, but <laughs> not so much in the statistics, but in the interpretation. The way that they put it, higher than 30 is always wrong, and then the ANOVA method of higher than 10 is always wrong. That is because they are measuring different things. This range method, it measures the standard deviation, right? sigma level. The ANOVA method measures variance sigma squared. Now, that is a different unit. Right? If you square things and then take the percentages that come out of it, they're completely different. You, you can also uh, not add up, well, you can, but not in a simple way, the numbers that you get in this R&R type of calculation. So the uh, repeatability plus reproducibility plus part-to-part -part variation is going to be more than your total variation, which is strange. In the ANOVA method, that doesn't happen. But in the ANOVA method, all of those sources of variance, they all add up to 100%, which is nice. Right? This, by the way, is the main argument I often see for choosing the ANOVA method. But those people forget to mention that standard deviation, so all of the numbers you see there, they are actually in the unit of measurement of that measurement system, which I think is quite a big advantage as well, right? So if we can get around the sort of statistics behind that, the variances add up to 100, 
but the standard deviations do not add up to 100. And ooh, ooh, ooh. Those standard deviations, they are expressed in something that we can immediately use to also judge you know, what is happening in practice. If we see that we've got a, a repeatability of 0.2, then, uh, and that is then standard deviation because of it, so it's not the percentage yet, we can also say, oh, okay, right, so about 95% of that will be between 0.4 and 0.4, right? Minus 0.4 plus 0.4 around the mean. It gives us quite a good direct estimation that we are also used to, because we're using the 2, the 3, uh, 6, sigma type of calculations. This gauge R and R is often used together with six sigma, with SPC, with CPK, which are all sigma based, so standard deviation based ways of measuring things. Now, Dr. Wheeler did actually make a very nice, but honestly, even more complicated. I'll, I'll get to the bottom of it and also make an explainer video about it. But he made a a system where you can check the R and R of a gauge compared to how you use it in the SPC chart, which I think is brilliant. It's really what we need. His system does use variances and add up to 100. But um, the, these two, the, the more traditional ones, this one does have a big advantage of being in that same unit of measurement. If you are checking the actual variances, basically all of what you see in the calculations, all those sums of squares, they say nothing. They are absolutely bonkers. And of course, you don't really need to look into all of those calculations because you will use just the percentage of the variance that is due to the measurement system. That's your R&R based on the ANOVA method. But still, right? I think that many people judge this version too quickly as being some old system when we didn't know better. If you square all these things, they also add up to 100. So system works just as fine, but you just use a different scale for your reference and it is a perfect system as well. Those very little differences that you get out of it by uh, maybe this one is a little bit stricter than that method or not, in practice that will not help you along. This is more something for statisticians to quabble about or maybe Six Sigma master black belts that really like the statistics more than the actual process improvement. Because remember why we are doing gauge r &R. We want to know, is our measurement system good enough for what we're trying to do, which is testing our product, steering our process. This method will help you brilliantly. That method also works. Although I will sort of add that I added in a yellow zone as well. But I think you should drop that bottom to about eight, maybe even seven, to say then it is really good. Because you will see that if you are at 15 or so in the standard deviation, you are really lower than 10 here. 10 here is often, and it depends a bit on where the source of variation is coming from, 25-ish, right? So this system here, when it is between 10 and 30, that really is quite good for almost all things. When it is 10 here, if it really is 10, well, I mean, it's not world-class yet. See where, why I don't really like that we use both of the systems. Uh, but I don't want to leave the system behind yet. Although I did make quite a bit of effort to get it to move on. And that is, you know, one of the reasons I had for really loving this system is I can make it into a standalone Excel file that does all of these calculations for you. And when you use even the automated Excel option, right, in the statistics toolkit, there, there is this way that you can generate an ANOVA if you lay out your table of R&R results properly, which does require you to lay them out in a way that's not very ideal of, for entering the data, problem one then you get a nice ANOVA table with all of the variances. You then have to do an F-test on the interaction and you have to pick and pull those parts of the, vari uh, of the variance and add them up to 100 and then you know, see what the percentages are, add two of them together. 
that is quite a bit of extra work, so I didn't want to put that in a file for you. But okay, um, I just at some point decided to go through all of the ANOVA statistics and I made that into also an Excel usable system that for now I'm sort of keeping for the HRNR course, which is also out now. So check those links. I made an entire course around how to do that gauge r, &R around how to use the template. I mean, you've been, many of you ha have been working with my template already for quite some time, the, the original average and range template, but now we've got a nice version that is and inclusive of ANOVA, but more importantly, a whole course to explain to you how to use it and why you use it, what the formulas are doing, how to use it, how to get it in practice. So I hope you are as excited about that as I am. Go check out those links. Don't forget to hit the like button for this video as well, but go, go check out the course. I'm, I'm really proud that I got my second one up. Hope to serve you with that. For now, I just want to wish you the best of luck in your gauge r, &R and understanding all of these statistics because sometimes, oh, sometimes they are just, <clears throat> but even then, do not forget to also enjoy the continuous improvement journey.